my title here, putting a question mark as to whether it's a future pathway for genetic improvement. And what I hope to describe through my talk is that really this is a complementary technology. It's not something that's going to solve the world's problems, but it needs to be used within the systems that we already have for production. And then there's a lot of obstacles, some of which were brought up uh, in the talk about uh, risk, um, that need to be considered whether uh, we're trying to perceive whether this technology is safe for the consumer, uh, how we get through regulatory, and then what sort of risk is for the producer in trying to market animals that have used this technology for improvement. I'm speaking to you first as a junior cattleman. Uh, I've been in the cattle business since uh, 1975 when I picked up my first weaning worksheet that my dad had never filled out um, from his purebred Red Angus operation. And the qu question I've had the entire time uh, throughout my life is, how do we know which animals are best? In the past two years, when I left my government job, um, it was really to focus on what is the promise of genome editing for allowing some of this rapid genetic improvement. And so here's an outline of my talk. I'll just be going over some of the basics of the tools. Uh, and then I'll give you some examples of how our company has deployed traits and really talk about it, adoption of that technology, implementation, and, and what the potential business impacts could be. And then really I'm going to wrap up with what's missing and what's next because there's a lot of gaps for the actual use of this technology uh, to be fully implemented within our food animal systems. We all know about the global food uh, security issues um, and really technology has to be a part of some of the solutions uh, to overcome these situations. Uh, whether it be climate change, uh, the increase in global population which comes along with it, the burgeoning middle class and the demand for animal protein and then the decrease in arable land per capita. We believe that in, in part editing can help solve some of these problems. So how does this really fit in with food animals and how does it work? So just to describe the technology on a very basic level, and so once you have a double strand break, your cell doesn't like that, and so it can either go in and repair it correctly or incorrectly, and that leads to insertions or deletions in certain parts of the DNA that may have a phenotype, especially if it's in a gene of importance. You can also do the second method here, and this is how you would introduce in specific base changes for a variant change you wanted to make. So that's typically what we would call integration, so moving an allele from one genetic background into a new genetic background, so pre precise crossbreeding. And then you can also use these nucleases to make double strand breaks, clip out a section of DNA and paste in a new section. So very precise, very accurate, and it's a very simple concept. If we consider this nuclease and the instructions for uh, changing the gene how we want, what traits do we want to put into these animals? We especially want to focus on consumer benefits because they're the ones that have to accept this technology as a part of their food product at the end of the day. Uh, it also has to have, of course, benefit for the farmer, uh, we wanted to tell a story about sustainability and of course what's different from uh, most edits that we've seen or transgenics that we've seen created for animals is does it improve animal welfare. Here's an example of some of the demonstration animals that we have made in our company. Uh, we've made a, a GDF8 or myostatin knockout in a lorry uh, here on the right named Samson at Texas A&M. Uh, we have our genetically dehorned uh, Holstein cross bulls, which I'll talk about in more detail. Uh, we have slick or heat tolerance uh, dairy and beef, uh, which is new this year. Genetic castration, so this is where the animals actually never develop fully uh, or go through puberty. And the idea there is to eliminate physical castration. FMD resistant swine, uh, we also have edits for that for cattle. I won't talk about these two things. And then bovine QTN, which are quantitative trait nucleotide for marbling, carcass growth, carcass traits, or dairy traits. And then lethals, which we know exist from uh, the bottlenecks that have been gone through in artificial insemination, heavy use of that in the dairy industry, which has caused a loss in fertility due to recessive lethals. So we have fixes for all those things. Talking about the pulled story, basically most high merit dairy animals have horns. That's because Holstein's the most popular breed and they're, they're naturally horned. Uh, there are pulled Holsteins that do exist. Um, so in general, in the US, there's about 15 million calves that are pulled each year. About 9 million of those are dairy. Uh, the rest would be some of the horned beef breeds. 
I know I used to take part in that on the farm when we had Charlet and Semitol and Gelvy crosses with our Red Angus, and we did that at pre-weaning uh, by burning the buttons off. Here, there's also caustic paste can be applied, but generally the cost is somewhere between $7.50 and $10 per animal. In Australia, with much more extensive production where they round up the cattle only once a year, they dehorn at a much later time, and they actually have a 1% mortality loss from polling Brahm and cross animals. Uh, but we know that really, in this story, there's growing pressure from the consumers and the retailers to source sustainable animals, and part of that uh, sustainability is also animals that haven't suffered through any pain. So the cost is not really an issue as far as the farmer solving this problem. Uh, we believe he would pay somewhere between five and twenty dollars per animal, and we believe our solution is to actually apply genome editing to get rid of the horns uh, prepartum. We believe it's a safe, no-risk method to integrate the pulled genetics. Where this allele comes from, it's a natural allele that's found in pulled beef breeds. We know that this allele has been around for more than a thousand years and under selection by farmers since then. Um, and the more important thing is we've been eating this allele safely for a long, long time. We did a media campaign aside from the publication. Uh, we made the front page of the New York Times in November 2017. Um, I will tell you that uh, the only group that came out against the use of this technology was PETA, and we know why that is, because they're against animal egg. The other thing that's interesting is the Humane Society, they endorsed the use of this technology because it's reducing pain and suffering in the animals, and that they would continue to endorse this technology on a case-by-case -case basis if it was affecting animal welfare. That's the product that we have closest to commercialization in Pol, but I want to talk more about a problem that's more global, and that is... Uh, rising livestock populations, and most of that increase in, in animals is coming from animals that aren't productive, okay? So when we talk about solving the problem of greenhouse gases, instead of making possibly more efficient cows, which we do incrementally here in the developed world, just getting rid of unproductive animals, so it takes nine animals in India to make the same amount of milk as it does in the U.S., uh, any genetic progress we can make towards this would have a tremendous effect on reducing the number of cows and greenhouse gas emissions. And they're usually in this belt where there's a high amount of disease that's hard to overcome and it's what's kept uh, intensive production of livestock a poor investment in these areas. Okay? So there's a lot of efforts to try and improve that in India and East Sub-Saharan Africa for sure. And so I'm going to talk about a trait that could possibly address this and that has to do with heat stress because a heat stress affects uh, resiliency to disease, nutrition and, and uh, health, and also the productivity of the animal uh, because if it's not suffering from heat, it's able to keep eating and keep producing. So the phenotype uh, that you can see is the hair is half that of normal length when it slicks out in the summer, and it also is less dense. So even though Zebu has a slick coat, it, the hair is much more dense, so it's not quite the same. Uh, the slick animals also have larger sweat glands and are more active. And if you measure their body temperature, even when they're not under heat stress, it it's, can be up to a degree cooler uh, than a normal uh, haired animal. Okay, so this is all the phenotypic characterization of this trait that went on before genomics. We actually found three mutations, all within the same gene. So this seems to be an area of plasticity in the genome that can undergo mutation and allow adaptation. So what happens is, in the slick animal, this bottom part has been deleted and so the thermostat is sort of broken. The animals don't know they're hot. And there's also those phenotypes that keep them cooler where there's been a change in the skin. So what does that mean? They don't feel that they're hot. They're not going to start dumping glucose into their bloodstream and going into panic uh, that they need to feed their brain because they can't eat anymore because they're too hot and they're panting all the time. We know this allele works because Australia's adopted it in all their tropical composites. They brought Centipole in just for that one gene. And now they have lots and lots of animals with it, and it accounts for 60% of the variation for coat length in uh, their composite animals. We also know that it's going to be used in dairy because uh, LIC has introduced slick from Centipole and crossbreeding into dairy animals, and now you can buy these three-quarter dairy, one-quarter centipole animals that transmit slick to every single offspring, so you can make slick dairy heifers that we'll be able to use in a tropical dairy environment. We know that this works. The slick animals have one copy of slick, get 1,500 more pounds of milk per lactation. What's more impressive 
is that they breed back 30 days faster than a normal haired animal. So that would apply also to beef cattle as well as the dairy animals. So uh, you don't have all of these problems with retained placenta or, or other health problems of getting that, uh, that reproductive tract back up and running uh, even though they're producing milk or, or uh, uh, having, a, having a calf on their side and, and feeding them at the same time. So that's the story of slick. Uh, I think that that's a trait that covers not only animal health, animal welfare, uh, but it also addressed some global problems that it would allow us to possibly increase production per animal and reduce cattle numbers in, a pl in, in countries where cattle numbers are going up uh, based upon the demand for protein. So what are some of the other targets that we're looking at as a company? Disease resistance is probably the best area for editing uh, that could have the largest economic effect. The problem is, is the tools we've been using to do genomics to find the variants and where they're located and which ones are important don't interrogate those regions. There's gaps in the genome. The SNPs are not there. And so when you do a disease resistance study, there's three or four regions of the genome where uh, there's innate immunity being expressed, and we're not interrogating that in our GWAS studies. So genomes are being fixed, that pro that's in progress, and we need to redesign the chips and go back and look at those populations, that's one way. The other way is that if we understand some of the molecules involved in the disease, we can do what's called rational design. So we can edit those genes to drop the function that allows them to interact with a virus or a bacteria, and thus would make an animal resistant.